Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, George. Thank you for remembering. Appreciate it. Well, it's good to be with you, and what a great day of worship we've already had. Um, thank you so much for the music. Uh, thank you for leading out, uh, George, with our prayer and, uh, and the other presentations that we've had today. Uh, God is good, isn't he? Um, let's bow our heads one more time as I prepare to share the message. Father, uh, Lord, uh, we know that you're here with us, and we just continue in the same spirit of humility and submission, just asking that you would speak to us, Father, uh, as we uh, continue in this uh, spirit of worship, Lord. Speak to us from your word, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Um, I had Arlene change in the bulletin the title to Still the Bride, since that was the title of my sermon last week, um, and uh, I'm, I'm doing the same message that I was uh, planning on. It's part of a series I've been doing called Faith Matters, Faith Matters, and we've been going through different topics and articles of faith during this series, and uh, this week I'm talking about the bride, the bride, or even we might say still the bride. Let me ask you, is the church still the bride of Christ? Oh, you don't sound convinced. <laughs> uh, I'm used to a little bit better response than that. Hopefully we can come to a, a better conclusion by the end of, of the presentation. I believe that the church still is the bride of Christ, and uh, I know you do as well. I'm just playing with you a little bit. But because it is uh, sometimes a few weeks between uh, messages, just a little dovetail, uh, uh, if I may, between the last uh, message that I preached on this series of Faith Matters. I talked about the second coming of Christ, and that's what the word parousia uh, simply means. It means coming or the presence of Jesus Christ. And really what I tried to emphasize in that message, uh, and again, when I'm going through this series, I'm not trying to just present the standard Adventist approach to these different doctrines. I'm really trying to uh, uh, generate a, a renewed interest in why our faith matters. So what we believe the Sabbath? What does that matter? So we believe in creation. How does that matter? So we believe in the cross. How does that matter? So that, that's kind of my approach to this. And so sometimes people get a little, uh, well, I didn't hear the standard things when you talked about that. I didn't hear those old faithful, old Seventh-day Adventists. And that's fine. It's not that I'm avoiding that. It's I'm trying to present these with a little bit of a twist to refresh and remind ourselves why these things matter. And when it comes to the second coming of Christ, um, really the issue that I wanted to bring to you is what matters is how it affects you. Sometimes when it comes to the second coming, we get so focused on what others are doing. What, what is the Lord going to do? What are the nations going to do? What's the Antichrist going to do? What's the U.S. doing? What's the Pope doing? You know, and that's fine. These are signs, you know, what's happening in the sun, moon, and stars? What's happening in the ecology? Well, you know, that's fine. These are part of the signs of the times. But really, when it comes down to it, the second coming of Christ is what are you going to do in light of this faith? In light of this truth that Jesus is coming soon, what are you going to do, right? And so uh, we need to be people of hope and love and humility and holiness. We talked about that, and then it should be a supreme motivation for us to care about the lives of our uh, fellow human beings in, in our community. So it should be very motivating to evangelism. So as a Seventh-day Adventist church, as a church that cares deeply about the second coming, we put it into our very denominational name. These are some of the things that we should be thinking about. Are you a person of hope? It can get discouraging with all the things going on in the world, and yet the second coming should give us hope. We should be a people of love. We should be humble. We should be uh, letting the Holy Spirit renew in us the image of Jesus Christ through a holiness, and we should be the first in line when it comes to opportunities to be involved in evangelism, and that has many elements as well. But uh, again, so we're just dovetailing that into this week. I'm going to move into a different topic. Oh boy, it's funny how PowerPoint uh, looks when you change it from one machine to another. Um, we're going to talk about the bride. Now, the bride is a reference in the Bible to God's special relationship with His people, okay? Uh, and, and you can ask the question, which came first, bride with Adam and Eve and God adopted the imagery of the bride? Or was that always in God's understanding from the very beginning, that whenever he thinks about his relationship with people, regardless of the context or situation, the, the level of intimacy and the level of trust that is experienced between a husband and wife has always been God's 
understanding of the expression of trust and love. In the Old Testament, when God uh, saw Israel faithful, He would compare them to a faithful woman and a bride. When they were unfaithful, then he, the prophets would come and say, Israel, you are like an unfaithful woman. And, and so we see that imagery a lot. So for my kids' quiz today, I'm going to just be asking to see how well we remember some of the important figures uh, of the Bible that uh, comprise the bride. And I'm starting with the tribes of Israel. When I was growing up, I had a youth pastor challenge me. I was probably about Toby's age, 12, 13. Okay, a little, little younger than Toby. Where is Toby? Where's my son? There you are. Okay. Yeah, keep an eye on you, boy. You can't slip out of church when I'm here, up here to preach. When I was about Toby's age, I had a youth pastor challenge me, and he said, look, if you can know all of the names of your favorite baseball team, if you can know all the names of the characters in your favorite television sitcom, if you can know all the names of your favorite cartoon characters, I was big into Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, right? How many of you can name the characters of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Come on. Ah, some truth for uh, some people out there uh, willing to be honest. All right. If you can know these names from your pop culture and things that you like, shouldn't we also be able to know the important names of the people in the Bible? So anyways, from that time on, I, I, I tried to uh, learn the names, and I, I memorized the names of the tribes of Israel in pairs. But for the quiz, I just want to see if any of the kids can remember the names of the tribes of Israel. Would you raise your hand? Gina will bring a mic to you. Um, can you remember any of the names of the? Okay, I see Isaiah's hand up. And why don't you grab Ketzia? Gina, Ketzia's right here. Reuben, Benjamin. You're going to do them all? <laughs> She's like counting on her fingers. <laughs> okay, and Reuben and Benjamin, yes. Do one more, if you can think Reuben, of one. Reuben, Benjamin, and Levi? Levi, okay. Reuben, Benjamin, and Levi. And then Isaiah is going to help us. I see that. Judah. Judah, all right, very good. We've got four. Do you know there's more than 12? There's 14. Sebastian. Oh, Sebastian, That's thank not you. one, but he's going to... Simon. Simeon or Simon. It's actually the same name, just depending on how it's spelled and pronounced. That's right. We're up to five. <laughs> Can you remember any more? Is it Isaiah again or is that Dylan? Dan? Daniel. Dan. 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 That's right. All right, Toby. Issachar. Issachar. Uh, what are we at? Seven, eight, something like that. Any of the young people, this is for all the kids, so if they want to help out, we'll just raise their hand, we'll, we'll include them. Oh, Anna? Asher. Asher? Hey, that's pretty good. Some of these are, you know, not the, the more prominent ones we might think of. You guys are making uh, Miss Gina work. I like that. That's good. Sebastian, then we're going to come to Ellie. Hebron? 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 No, no, not that I'm aware of, but it's a good, a good Old Testament name. <laughs> Gad? Gad. Gad. All right, we're starting to run out of steam on this, so let me, let me put them on the name. These are the pairs in which I learned them. The oldest were Reuben and Simeon. They were the oldest. Then the more popular ones are the Levites, you know, come from Levi. That's what the tribe of Moses was from. Uh, and then, of course, the lineage of Judah is where the kings and Jesus come from. Then there's the three-letter names, Gad and Dan. Gad and Dan, that's how I learned them. And then there's the similar names, Asher and Issachar. They both begin with a vowel, they have an S in them, and they end with R. Then there's the strangest, Zebulun and Naphtali. You don't meet too many Zebulins and Naphtalis these days, do you? You ever run around, what's your name? My name's Naphtali. It's not very common, is it? So they're kind of strange. And then the two that were the favorite of their father, Jacob. Remember their names? Joseph and Benjamin. And then Joseph goes to Egypt, and he has two sons. Jacob adopts Joseph's sons, and they become the half-tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh. So 14 tribal names, but the number 12 is always preserved. This is partly why um, Joseph's sons become half-tribes. They take his one tribe inheritance and it's divided between the two of them. And then Levi, it was special because he did not get land. His inheritance was the ceremonies of the temple. All right, next one, and this is the, the only other one. Now let's go to the New Testament. Do you know your apostles? 
Do you know your apostles? Can you name the 12 or more apostles? <laughs> all right, we actually have Raiden all the way back in the corner, and then we're going to come on over here. You guys be thinking about it. And again, I memorize, the, memorize these in pairs. Paul. Paul is an apostle. That's right. He's not one of the gospel apostles, but he does become one of the apostles later on. I feel kind of like she's Vanna White, you know, going back and forth, making sure the letter. <laughs> Peter. Peter, and who is his brother? Uh, Andrew. Peter and Andrew, that's, they're a set of brothers. John. John, and who is John's brother? Uh, uh, James. John and James. Okay, we've got a few of them there. And then we have some other young people up here. And then we're probably going to have to call a good. Right here. Matthew, Mark, Judas, and Andrew. Matthew, yes, not Mark. And who is the third one? Judas and Peter? Oh, and Andrew. Okay, you got some of them. Good, Ketsia. The other James. The, <laughs> the other James. All right, and last, last one here. Matthias, yes, he's also one of the new, uh, acts. So again, I memorize them in pairs. You have the two sets of brothers. They're all fishermen, Peter and Andrew, uh, not their original names uh, for either of them. Peter's name was given to him by Christ. Andrew probably took the name Andrew later on. It's not a, a Hebrew name. It is a Greek name. Very unlikely that Peter was his original name. It's a very Greek name, and he probably uh, took it later on in life in similar to what um, uh, Peter did. Then you have James and John, the other two fishermen, uh, the friends, Philip and Nathaniel, they were friends. Philip finds his friend Nathaniel in John chapter 1. And he says, have you heard about this Jesus from Nazareth? And it's Nathaniel that says, can anything good come from Nazareth? Nathaniel's name is also Bartholomew, which is some, simply means son of Talmea. Then you have the THs, and this is just how I memorize them, the TH, because there's a lot of THs and other names. You have Thomas and Matthew, whose name was also Levi. And then you have the Judes, hey Jude. Jude, whose name is also Thaddeus, so there's another teacher, and then the infamous Judas Iscariot, and then you have the two thes, Simon the Zealot, and James the Little, or James the Less, or James son of Alphaeus is uh, another name for James, and then you have some additional apostles that come in the book of Acts, Matthias, who replaces Judas in Acts chapter 1. Paul becomes the most prominent of the apostles, but there are others. I put a question mark by Paul's name because it is likely that after James is killed in Acts chapter 12, the apostles do not gather again to, re to name another apostle to identify, to make sure the number 12 is maintained. You ever think about that before? In Acts chapter 1, Peter says, look, we got to have 12. Judas is gone. We need to have a 12. So they cast lots for Matthias, right? Then Matthias drops off the page of history altogether. We never hear of Matthias again. Uh, but then when James is killed in Acts chapter 12, the apostles do not meet again to say, well, who's going to be that 12th person? A lot of Bible scholars believe that they just said, well, let's let Paul be considered that 12th apostle. But of course, that's just theory. That's not biblical. It's just interesting. Now, the reason why, thank you. Um, that's, that's the end of the quiz. Thank you for going through that. Do you know that these names are going to be enshrined in eternity forever? Uh, and, and it's not just that we can memorize names or anything. It's just to consider why the Lord uh, indicates that these names have such prominence and how it plays into our understanding of the church and the bride. The Bi um, this is from the church's uh, Facebook page. Oh, boy, it looks so different here. The church is the bride for whom Christ died. This is the weekend when we remember with special emphasis the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to think about that statement just for a second. The church is the bride for whom Christ died. Did he die for you? Or did he die for the bride? Is there a difference? Oh, but there is a difference. 
And it's true that, yes, we always often hear, if there was one person on the planet or Jesus would have died for that one person, if only one person would believe in him, Jesus still would have gone to the cross. That is absolutely true. He loves everybody individually and uniquely. Absolutely. But Jesus did not just die for you. He died for everyone who accepts his sacrifice on our behalf. Now, the reason why this is important Sometimes within the Christian life, we get so obsessed with the idea that Jesus died for me that we forget he also died for you. And while we want the mercy of Christ for ourselves, while we want the forgiveness of Christ, while we want the relationship with Christ for ourselves, and when we mess up, we say, oh, Lord, I'm so sorry. Would you just, I know you've died for my sins and I shouldn't be doing it. But Lord, thank you for dying for me. We sometimes forget to extend that same mercy towards others within the family who sin themselves. And we forget that Jesus died for them also. Yes, he died for you individually, but he died for us all. And that characteristic, that reality should influence our very relationship with one another and how we relate. Yes, he died for me, but guess what? He died for you too. And I want to have that same character. He, the church is the bride for whom Christ died. That he might sanctify and cleanse her. Question, was the church sanctified and cleansed before Jesus died for her? Before Jesus died for her, was the church perfect and sanctified and cleansed? No, no. When Jesus died on the cross, was the, was the church, was the Jewish nation serving him and worshiping and loving him? This, uh, I don't mean to, am I being tricky? I, I, I see some blank expressions. <laughs> God, understand this. It is the death of Jesus Christ that makes the perfection and the sanctification and cleansing of the church possible. Right? You remember that when the Roman soldier stuck that spear up underneath his ribs to verify that Jesus was dead, these experts in execution, he knew right where to stick that spear to plunge it up into his heart to make sure if we take him down off this cross, he's going to be dead. We're going to make sure that he's dead. When that soldier stuck that spear up under his ribs and into his heart, what flowed from his side? You remember two, two things flowed from his side. Water and blood. Water and blood. Those two things that illustrate the mercy and forgiveness and cleansing of God. Blood that cleanses us on the inside. That's what your blood is doing, circulating, taking out the impurities. And the cleansing water for the outside, inside and out. Jesus, that rock that was struck, brought out the very things necessary for our salvation, our cleansing. So it was before we were perfect. It was before we were ready to accept him that Jesus said, I'm going to die for you. At his return, his parousia, at his return in triumph, he will present her to himself, a glorious church, the faithful of all ages, the purchase of his blood, not having spot or wrinkle, but holy and uh, without blemish. Notice it says, at his return, she will be holy and without blemish. Is she holy and without blemish right now? Are you holy and without blemish right now? Are we as an institution, an organization? By faith, of course. When you accept Jesus Christ, he covers you with his robe of righteousness. You know, there's nothing more beautiful than a bride on her wedding day. Wouldn't you agree? Just a few years ago, By the way, these are pictures of pictures, so the resolution may not be the greatest. What color is her hair, by the way? Blonde. Gina is not blonde. <laughs> she was dyeing her hair back then. But her grandmother, Grandma Jean, always made it clear when we began dating. She would say, now you know Gina's hair is not blonde. It's red. She may have her hair blonde now, but it's red. She did not, she, she missed Gina's red hair when she started dyeing it. But I married a blonde. Um, and uh, her cousin Mandy did her hair that day. Yeah, there we are. Just, yeah, well, I don't know, a couple years ago is all. I'm wearing a wig, of course. <laughs> the Bride. If you have your Bibles, open up to Revelation 21. It won't be on the screen. 
I'm going to be reading a large portion of the chapter here, beginning in verse 9. I'd like you to follow along with me, if you will. What a joy and delight it is to be able to have the book of Revelation, be able to study and read it um, with you this morning. What a powerful message it is for us in these days in which we live. Revelation 21 and verse 9. It, it, it's toward the end of your Bibles, Revelation. It's kind of toward the end. Jim got that. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> Revelation 21 and verse 9. Now, there's so much in this. I'm going to have to do my very best to restrain myself um, in, in the context of our, our time and our worship today. So, um, but I'm going to do my best because there's so many beautiful things here. Beginning in verse 9 of Revelation 21, it says this, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last pa- plagues came and spoke with me saying, Come here and I will show you the bride the wife of the land. Very interesting that it was one of the angels of wrath. That's what they're called. The seven angels who had the bowls of the wrath of God. They're called the angels of wrath. And it's one of these angels that is chosen. There's dozens of angels throughout the book of Revelation. There's angels all over the place, ministering spirits. and others. But it's one of the angels of wrath who is chosen and selected and, 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 and that comes to John to reveal to him the bride. Now, keep your finger there. Just go a page or two back to um, chapter 17 in verse 1, and you'll see an interesting correlation. Revelation 17 in verse 1, Then one of the seven angels, very similar, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you. Now, up until this point, it's been the exact same language from Revelation 21.9. I will show you, but this time it's not the bride, the wife of the Lamb. I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. So really, Revelation is a comparison. Much of Revelation is a comparison between uh, two things, between the true church and the false church, between the false city of Babylon and the true city of Jerusalem, between fallen angels and between holy angels, between, uh, the, between the true Christ and the Antichrist. So Revelation 21, as, as we begin to learn about this great city that is the bride of Christ, it is in comparison to the fallenness of Babylon that we are presented with here. So these two are compared. But it's one of the angels of wrath. Back now in Revelation 21 and verse 9, it says, uh, the, he says, Come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Now keep in mind, as we begin to read about the city, the city, which is a real city. I know there's a lot of symbolism in Revelation. I believe it's a real city. But the, the characteristics of the city are there to help us understand about the bride, the people. It's not just a pretty city that we hope we can live in someday. It's a description of the things that will characterize the people of God who are the bride of Christ. We need to remember that. So he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, uh, out of heaven from God. So he sees this city in the sky coming down, right? Right? And the reason why he begins to describe the exterior of the city is kind of logical. He couldn't see inside just yet. He's seen it from, you know, he's on a mountain, but he's looking up, and that city's in the sky, and he sees the wall first, he sees the exterior, the gates, and only as that city comes down is he able to see and describe the interior. Verse 11, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, a stone as clear as crystal jasper had a great and high wall with 12 gates and all the gates had 12 angels so very similar to genesis how an angel was placed at the gate of the garden of eden to prevent adam and eve from having access to the tree of life but now there are angels there also at the gates of the new jerusalem and names were written on them and they are the names of the 12 tribes of the son of israel of the sons of israel those names are there There were three gates to the east, three on the north, three on the south, and there were three gates on the west. Access equally given in all four directions. You know, a couple weeks ago, we had Tim Rosenberg here talking about the king of the north, the king of the south. How many of you guys have seen that? If you, it's online. If you go onto our, uh, our YouTube page, you can watch that presentation. Wonderful, wonderful information there. This is different though. There is equal access on all four sides of this city. Uh, um, verse 14, and the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. 
Very interesting. Then the one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city, its gates and its wall. The city's laid out square. Its length is as great as its width. He measured the city with a rod. 1,500 miles, its length and width and height are equal. Now, it's un- impossible to tell from the Greek if, if John is describing each side of the city being 1,500 miles or if the circumference of the city is 1,500 miles. What we do know is that at that time, the Greek way of measuring cities was by circumference. So most Bible commentators believe that he's describing the circumference of the city as 1,500 miles. As, uh, as fate would have it, that's almost exactly the size of the state of Arizona. If the circumference of the city is 1,500 miles, that would mean the state of Arizona is the equivalent size of the New Jerusalem. Isn't that fascinating? I think it's great. When I lived in the Northwest, it was Oregon. Oregon was the closer one. Uh, So I would say it's about the size of Oregon. But it just so happens that here in Arizona, uh, it's only off by 100 miles. Anyways, a lot of great information. (laughs) He measured its wall, verse 17, 72 yards according to human measurements, also the same as angelic measurements. The measure of the wall, or the material of the wall, was jasper, which is a greenish kind of stone, is my understanding. Um, which is great for me. That's my favorite color. I think it's going to be beautiful. The city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundation stones of the uh, city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first uh, foundation stone was jasper, second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardis, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophase, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. Now, we only know what eight of those stones are. Four of them we've been unable to identify. The same with the breastplate of the high priest, the 12 stones, which is what this is a a tie into, the 12 stones of the breastplate of the high priest. We only know what a handful of those are because these stones don't carry the same names for thousands of years and are not identified the same way. And we don't know if uh, uh, if John was very gifted in being able to identify. I mean, of course, he was led by the Holy Spirit, but we don't know precisely which stones he means in at least four of those. But it is a call back to the breastplate of judgment that the high priest wore. Those stones will now be uh, placed on the foundations of the new Jerusalem. Verse 21, the 12 gates had, were 12 pearls. Y'all heard of the pearly gates before, right? 12 pearls. I don't know exactly how that works. Have you tried to picture how a pearl would be a gate? I don't know if it was like a portcullis that would raise or they'd roll it out of the way or if it was, I don't know. John was there. He saw it. The 12 gates are 12 giant single pearls. The street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. Now he begins to look into the city. Verse 22, I saw no temple in it. So the city has come down far enough as he's watched the spiritual vision of the new Jerusalem, the bride. Keep in mind, we're talking about the bride here that is caught up within the uh, characteristics of the city. The city's come down now low enough that from his high vantage point on the mountain, he's now able to see over that wall and he's looking around and he's saying, where's the temple? I mean, this is the new Jerusalem. What is Jerusalem without a temple, right? But he says, I saw no temple for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And I imagine he saw God seated on his throne and from him the light emitted. And he says, there's no need for a temple. Jesus is there. The city had no need for sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of the Lord is illuminated. Its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light. The kings will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, for there will be no night there, its gates will never be closed. And they will bring the glory of the honor of the nations into it. Nothing unclean. We're talking about the bride. Nothing unclean. No one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Names mentioned one more time. Now, at first glance, and I'm going quickly here, I, I realize our time is escaping us here, and my voice only has so much more it can go, Vince. It's about ready to give up. <laughs> um, at first glance, maybe after superficial reading or uh, without thinking of it carefully, you might read this description of the bride and say, wow, she's perfect. She is just one- radiant. I mean, obviously, we're talking about heaven, the end of sin. There should be nothing wrong with this place. Everything should be perfectly in stone, set, and, 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 and ready to go and radiant. But there's a couple of problems. There's a couple of problems with this city. There's a couple of problems with this bride. At least it can appear that way. We can be tempted to think of it that way. 
Now, there's several things that we could point out. Some people get really caught up in the dimensions of the city. How can it be so tall? How can it be this? What, what, are, the, what are the walls for? What do we need walls and cities in heaven for? And so you can get into that kind of uh, uh, discussion. Uh, another fascinating one for you. How is it that there are pearls in heaven? What are pearls? Where do they come from? They come from the suffering and death of oysters. How is it that there are pearls in heaven? Or are they supposed to be kind of like the scars on Jesus' hands? They're reminders of the cost of salvation. And every time you go through that gate and you go by that pearl, you're reminded of the suffering and death that was required for your salvation. It's an interesting question. Pearls also represent wisdom. But it's an organic gem. It's not like the other gemstones that are created uh, through other uh, geologic means. Is it symbolic? Is it real? I'll let you decide on that. The biggest problem we might have with the New Jerusalem, with the bride, I would share with you, are the names. The names. What do I mean by that? I would invite you to consider how can the Lord inscribe these names in that city and be part of that bride. Do you know your Bibles? Now, we're not going to go uh, one by one through this, but just a couple of things. Reuben. Reuben. Reuben slept with his father's wife, his brother's mother, and it became known to Jacob. Reuben was one of the lead instigators of the selling of Joseph into slavery. Simeon and Levi once slaughtered an entire community of men because one of them had violated their sister, violating the lex talionis, the law of retribution. They, they murdered an entire community of men. Well, what Judah, Judah was the prodigal patriarch. Judah once on one of his travel, travels, saw a prostitute and thinking that he would uh, engage in that activity with her, he accidentally impregnated his own daughter-in-law. And then when he learned his daughter-in-law was pregnant, he called for her to be executed through burning, something that was reserved only for pagan priestesses until she said, well, the person who made me pregnant happens to own this, uh, uh, own this thing. And, and then Judah recognized it was his. All of them participated in the selling of Joseph into slavery. How is it that these guys' names are going to be enshrined on the holy city that are part of the bride? Reuben? Levi? Even Judah? We said, well, that was them, you know, but that wasn't, you know, their descendants after them, they cleaned up the name. After them, you know, they, they got their story right, right? Okay, so Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin in the book of Judges becomes so odious that the other tribes rise up against Benjamin and virtually wipe them out from the face of the earth. At the end of the book of Judges, it says that the tribes came to the doorway of the tent of the meeting and they sat down on their legs or on their knees and they wept before the Lord saying, one of the tribes has been eliminated. Then they realized, well, there's a couple of guys left over and they concocted a scheme very bizarre scheme to keep the tribe of Benjamin from being totally wiped out. Benjamin almost completely disappears, but it's ironic that the first king of the United Empire was Saul, who was of the tribe of Benjamin. All, the ten tribes of the north, when uh, Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, becomes king over the Davidic kingdom, they were so unhappy with Rehoboam, they said, we're no longer going to be part of this community anymore. And so they become the kingdom to the north, Israel. And for 300 years, 10 of the 12 tribes live in abject idolatry and immorality. For 300 years, 10 of the tribes are so totally opposed to God that in 722 B.C., God brings the Assyrians and they are totally eliminated. They become the 10 lost tribes of Israel. Is anyone here British? Anyone largely British? Nicole? Okay. Uh, there's something known as British Israelism. Uh, the British for many years taught that they were the lost tribes of Israel. Why do you think that the leading image of Britain is a lion? A lion. They, they taught that, 
and they believe it's called British Israelism. Though the ten tribes were lost, they were so, so opposed to the things of God. And then Judah himself, the, the tribe of Judah, uh, doesn't do much better because then the Babylonians come and take them into captivity. And even to the time of Christ, which is where we get the word Jew, by the way, is from Judah, living in Judea. Even in the time of Christ, the Bible says in John that he came to his own and his own received him not. It was Jews from the tribe of Judah that crucified Christ. But Judah's name is going to be on that city. Are you comfortable with that? Can you live with that? Well, how about these guys? They're a lot better, aren't they? They really clean things up for us in the New Testament, right? These are men who made no mistakes. They followed the Lord perfectly, right? No, the Bible is so good that it doesn't hide the warts and problems of the people and the followers of God. We know of the many failings and faults of the different apostles, how Peter was willing to take his sword out and fight for Jesus when he's going to get arrested, nearly chops a guy's head off. The guy just moves his head at the last second and he takes his ear off. Remember that story? All right, Peter and all of his problems, the doubting, the jealousy, the arrogance, the violence. I crossed out Judas Iscariot's name. Now, it says in Revelation that the name of the 12 apostles, the 12, will be in that city. I don't think Judas's name is one of them. The Bible makes it very clear that the wicked's names will be blotted out. And Judas, who clearly rejected the Lord, I think is probably one of the replacement apostles that we learn about in the book of Acts, whose name will be on that holy city. Whether it's Matthias or Paul, we'll find out. We'll find out. You see where I'm going with this a little bit. The new Jerusalem, the bride is made up of people. Of people. And as long as it's made up of people, the bride will sometimes struggle to represent the high ideals of Jesus Christ. But despite that, Jesus in all of His power, in all of His love, says, I am the bridegroom. And I love her anyways. She may have made terrible mistakes, violent, vicious, incredible sins, but she is still my bride. And I will still love her. I will still die for her, knowing that it is through that act that she will find the cleansing and sanctification that she needs. And he did it before they were perfect. And the entire story of the Bible, from almost beginning to end, from, from Genesis chapter, the first chapters, where the bride loses faith with God, the bride is separated from God because of sin, the entire story of the Bible, from beginning to end, is how the bridegroom is trying to restore his relationship with that woman so that at the very end they can finally be reunited. Then he can come and be with his people. Now, my question to you is, if that is Jesus' attitude toward the bride, what should our attitude be? How many of you have ever been hurt by the church? Uh, don't, I'm, I'm not looking. Rhetorical, I shouldn't have said that. Put your hands down. Let me just assume, at some point, every single person who has been in relationship with part of God's church has suffered has not seen the high ideal of God's calling always expressed in every way. And there's a temptation at times to say, I don't want to be part of the bride anymore. I'm going to cut myself off. And sometimes they're very real. Uh, there's a book uh, by Reggie McNeil called um, The Future... Oh, I've forgotten the name of it. The Present Future Church. Anyway, he says in the book, this is the important part, Many people leave the church not because they've lost their faith. They leave the church because they think that's the only way to keep their faith. You know, and there's some truth to that, right? There's some truth. And we know statistically that most of the people that leave the Seventh-day Adventist church, most of them are not opposed to our teachings. It's not because they want to eat meat. It's not because they want to be Catholic. It's not because they've given up on our teachings or our doctrines. You know that 80% of people who leave the church still tithe? 
We don't even have 80% in the church that tithe. 80% by, by many multiple statistical surveys. Many people still value uh, uh, elements of the church. They just take a step back and say, I've been wounded, I've been hurt, there's been so many problems, I'm still going to be part of the periphery, I'm still going to kind of have this a little affair with the church, but I'm going to stay on the outside because of the pain I've suffered. It's real. It's absolutely real. But when I think about how God describes the church, His bride, Yes, she is pure and unblemished, but it's not because she has done that for herself. It's because that's what he has given to her. Uh, I'm almost done. Only another hour, I'll be done. Ephesians. We've read this verse many times. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing with of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all of her glory, having no spot or wrinkle by faith in Christ, because of the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, because of the patience of God, because of the glory of the mercy of God, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. She's still the bride. Even with all those names, she's still the bride. I'll promise you one thing. As long as I am part of the church, the church will not be perfect. Because I know that God's still working on me. I still know that I get upset at times. I lose my patience. I am not always the perfect image that Jesus wants for me. But by faith in Jesus Christ, I still have confidence that He calls me His own that He's willing to be work with me, to be patient with me. He calls me into community. He calls me into His intimate relationship with Him and with you. She's still the bride. But God demonstrates His own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, before we'd accepted Him, He died for us. Jesus died for us. Above all, Peter says, keep fervent in your love for one another. Even back then, Peter knew there was such a struggle within the church. It wasn't all hunky-dory there. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. We live in a culture and a climate right now where we are so easily offended. The littlest of things. We wake up in the morning offended. We look for it. I, I listened to a, a webinar years ago that said that being offended is now the new virtue. It's now the new virtue. And you listen to talk and you hear things in, in uh, uh, social media and people say, oh, did you hear about that? Oh, yeah, I did. I was really offended. Oh, really? Wow, you're such a great person. You were offended by that. I tell you, it's detrimental to our society, friends. It is not right. It is not good. Our eyes should be tuned towards Jesus Christ and what He does for each and every one of us, not focused on the problems. Can I give one one, one more illustration, please? Just happened this week at Costco. You ever been to Costco? Okay, big carts, right? And big stacks of aisles or big stacks of stuff. You can't always see, you know, when you're going around an aisle. Okay, so I've got my car. I'm going through a big stack. Can't really see, but, it, you know, I can't really go around my car. I, you just go slow, right? You kind of go slow. So I kind of went slow to get the car around the aisle. And right as I did, another person came, and our carts almost hit. Right? Didn't actually hit. This happens all the time, right? No problem. You, you see each other. You say, and I said, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you. Um, you know, I was coming out. I didn't see you. I apologize. I've done this a thousand times. It's never been an issue. But as I went by her... It just, I don't know. As I went by her, I heard her say under her breath. You know how people, when they say things under their breath, but they really want you to hear, right? I heard her say, so that's how you treat women. And I was just like, what? Is it, I just, come on. It was a complete, but you assume the worst. How can I be offended today? Who can I find that will fail me today? 
That is what our society is completely focused on. But in the church, friends, in the church, we are all part of the bride. And no matter what our faults and failings may be, as we work towards that high ideal, we should be as forgiving and loving towards one another as Christ is to each of us. He didn't just die die for me. He died for you too. He died for us all. He loves us all equally. Keep fervent in your love because love covers a multitude of sins. This is uh, one you've probably heard before from the Spirit of Prophecy. The Church of Christ, enfeebled and defective as it may be, is still the only object on earth of which he bestows his supreme regard. It's a beautiful thing, the church. There's nothing more beautiful than a bride on her wedding day. I want you to be part of that bride. Don't give up on her. He loves us. That's why he died for us. And I could give you many more illustrations and and analogies to that we will probably in future sermons. But I want you to remember the city, the city that is the bride. And if Reuben's name can be there, and if Peter's name can be there, and if all these other characters who we know, they weren't perfect, but because of their faith in Jesus Christ and his cleansing power and love for them, their names will be there, then we shouldn't be worried about our names or any of our names being there. He wants us all to be there. And whose names are written in the book of life, they will be there. Do you love each other today? Are you willing to be patient and courteous and kind? We need the Holy Spirit's help, don't we? God in heaven, Lord, thank you so much that we could think about these things today. Thank you, Father, for not giving up on us. Thank you that despite our faults and failings, and that does not, it's not a license for us to embrace imperfection, Lord. It, it's not, we shouldn't take for granted your mercy and your sacrifice and just dwell on our sins. Lord, help us to rise above. Help us to invite your Holy Spirit into our hearts every day that we could aspire to that beautiful bride you want us to be. It gives us such great confidence that if you could cleanse Reuben and if you could cleanse the sons of thunder and if you could help Thomas from his doubting and if you could help all of these individuals still have that place in the kingdom, Lord, you can help me and you can help those within my community as well. Help me to have that same sacrificial spirit that is so essential and necessary to a loving and healthy and humble relationship. Thank you, Lord for setting the example and making our salvation possible through your sacrifice on the, Christ, on the cross. Even when people were uh, at that very moment rejecting you and at that very moment humiliating and hurting you, you could cry out, Father, do not hold this sin against them. Wow. Lord, I know I have so far to go, but help us in this journey, Lord. Thank you so much that we can study together today. Bless us this Sabbath day as we go home. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I know the hour is late, but you have been great in your patience and indulgence. Um, Next week, we will be probably just as late. No, we'll we'll do our best, but thank you so much for being here. God bless. Happy Sabbath.